Hi, good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome all to Buddhist Fellowship. We are very delighted today to have Venerable Chanda to give us a talk. Uh, and the title of today's talk is on freeing ourselves from suffering. So Venerable Chanda came into contact with the Buddha's teachings in India at the age of 20. By 2010, the ascetic lifestyle, climate and diet in Burma had taken its toll on Venerable Chanda's health, leading to a return to the West. In 2012, she traveled to Australia after a chance discovery of Ajahn Brahm's teachings. She joined the Dhammasara community in Perth and took bhikkhuni ordination in 2014. In October 2015, Ajahn Brahm asked her to take steps towards establishing a nun's monastery in the UK and she has been there since. So we are very, very pleased today to have Venerable Chanda to give us a talk. But before that, we will have Venerable Chanda to give us a five to 10 minutes meditation, guided meditation. Um, so without further ado, um, I hand over the mic to Venerable Chanda. Thank you, Venerable Chanda. Over to you. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to be here. And uh, good morning to everybody in Singapore and Malaysia and anywhere else in that time zone. So, yeah, it's a privilege to be here and I'm really happy to be able to do this for you all. So I'm happy also to start with meditation because that just helps us to center our mind and bring our body into awareness and learn to just make peace a little bit before we listen to the Dhamma. So it's just going to be a short meditation for now. But even so, please take time to get yourself really comfortable because this is all part of establishing right intention and learning to look upon our body with kindly eyes. So if you wish, you can close your eyes. And when your eyes are closed, just sensing into the body. Noticing how the sensations in the body are happening in the here and now. helping you to move more and more closely into this present moment. The only moment we ever have. And just noticing how your body feels right now and if there's anything you can do to bring a little bit more comfort and ease to your body. might want to give your ankles or shins a bit more space. Check that your knees are not folded too tightly. If you're sitting on the floor, noticing whether the weight on the buttocks is evenly distributed. Or if you're on a chair, noticing the touch of the feet on the ground. Perhaps shifting your feet slightly forward, away from the knees, just to take any pressure off your knees. And sensing that connection with the ground, the earth, gravity. Allowing yourself to be held. Supported by the earth below. And fully inhabiting the space around and above you. So that you have a feeling of steadiness and also spaciousness in the mind. Breathing space.
Noticing the freedom of having nothing to do but simply arrive in this moment with a mind that's both aware and kind. If you wish, you can go on a journey with awareness and kindness by gently scanning your body from head to toe. Using mindfulness as a medium through which kindness can flow into every little part of the body, touching every cell. Suffusing the body with kindfulness. Noticing the power of that kind awareness to relax, soften, loosen any tensions, tightness, maybe aches or pains in the body, giving them permission to relax. No effort involved. It's as though you're simply bathing in the golden light of the sun. Resting for a moment with contentment. Savoring every moment, every breath. Knowing that even after this meditation ends, you can always return to this present moment wherever you are, whatever you're doing. It can be as simple as just one breath. So it's just a short meditation for now but you can pick this up any other time in the day, any time you have five to 10 minutes. Just reconnecting with kindfulness can make all the difference. Everyone looks like they're in meditation, but I would just invite you to gently come out in your own time. If you wish to open your eyes, you don't have to. And see if you can keep part of that kind awareness, even as you listen to the talk, 
inside your own body and mind. <clears throat> Very good. So no bells. This is the tradition of no bell silence. <laughs> so I'm not going to jolt you out. <laughs> this is talking about freeing ourselves from suffering. So that involves a lot of gentleness on the path. So I wanted to start this talk with a little phrase from the Majjhima Nikaya number 51. It's the Kandaraka Sutta. And I say this in almost every talk I give. But it's a very simple phrase that to me sort of sets the whole motivation and, and right view for practice. And that is simply that all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. In a sense, all of our humanity is dependent on seeing the humanity in others and seeing that others, just like ourselves, suffer. And we do search for happiness. This is one of the most basic, fundamental um, human drives. And yet we very rarely find the kind of deep and lasting happiness that our hearts really um, seek, partly because we're looking in the wrong place. And yet we know we suffer, right? We know we suffer, we suspect that there's something more, but we're not quite sure where to look or how to start looking. Ajahn Chah said it's like, um, we've got an itch on our head and we scratch our bum. <laughs> so we're looking for happiness that's fulfilling and, and satisfying in the world, which is basically transitory and completely unreliable. And also with that simile, it's not only that you're scratching in the wrong place, but if you're scratching your bum for long enough, it starts to get pretty sore, right? <laughs> and this can be how it feels sometimes, I think, when we're pursuing a certain, you know, course in life. So we have a certain amount of wealth or money, but it's not quite enough. So we have to work even harder to get more. And then, you know, we start to get a nice house, maybe lots of um, things that we then get a bit worried about and a bit attached to. So then we have to have gates on our houses and like <laughs> a dog to guard the place. So it just becomes more and more burdensome. And again, Ajahn Chah said, it's like we're trying to lessen our load by putting things in our backpack, by putting stones in our backpack. You know, it, it's kind of crazy and it's against uh, the real path of peace, the real direction of our happiness. So most of the time we're looking for what's called hedonic happiness in um, positive psychology as opposed to something called eudaimonic happiness, which means the happiness born of meaning, born of having a beautiful purpose in life. And I think this is much closer to what the Buddha was teaching. He was teaching of a happiness that is based on our goodness, on our virtue, on our inner qualities, our inner wealth. Yeah, and that's a very different direction from looking for happiness outside. So for me in my life, I was only a teenager, but I already kind of realized that although I had a nice family, I went to a good school, I had a best friend and a comfortable home, beautiful English countryside and rolling hills. Um, I was at the time in my life where I had to start making a choice which would impact the whole rest of my life. And I was only what, 16 or so. And I just thought, how can I make such a decision when I don't really understand why I'm here? And this was what sort of started for me, the spiritual path. I think my parents would laugh if they heard that because it didn't look very spiritual. I was a kind of rebellious teenager. <laughs> I also wore green velvet trousers, actually, <laughs> and suede flares and lots of kind of sequins and all sorts of crazy gear. My parents would say, you are not going out like that. <laughs> but it wasn't only being rebellious. It was a kind of deep um, quest for knowing why I was here and how... Um, I could use my life in a way that would help me to understand why we suffer and also to understand how we get free. And unfortunately, I hadn't heard of the Buddhist teachings at that time, but I had this idea, just this intuition that I needed to leave my hometown and travel overseas. And I'm so glad I did, because this was the part, the moment where the Buddha's teachings entered my life. So in a sense, sometimes our suffering and this sort of um, wish for a way out of suffering, a spiritual search, actually starts from that suffering and makes meaning of that suffering. 
And at that time, if we hear the Buddha's teachings, it can be so such a relief. You know, um, for me, when I heard that there is suffering and suffering has a cause, it was such a relief because until then I'd been thinking maybe there's something wrong with me and that's why I suffer. And yet deep down, I could see that there was suffering all over the world, especially caused by people's greed, by power struggles and so many other crazy things that we human beings do to each other. And the Buddha basically surmises his teachings. He says, I teach two things, the suffering and the end of suffering. But it doesn't mean that he's asking us to suffer. It actually means that he's showing us where we suffer, how we suffer and why, in order to activate that wish inside ourselves to be free. And then out of great compassion, he actually shows us a path. He shows us a way to walk, which will lead to ever increasing happiness and freedom. And uh, yeah, it's equally true in that sense to say that the Buddha teaches happiness and the path to happiness, the cause of happiness. Yeah. And the beauty of this path is that it's an ever increasing path to inner peace. So even if we only start with very simple things like just being that bit kinder to ourselves or by going the extra mile to help another person, um, we can already feel the benefits of that in our heart as long as we know where to look. And this leads all the way to deep meditations and eventually to Nibbana, which is you know, defined as the highest happiness, a state of complete contentment and peace. But however far we get on this path, it brings benefits. It brings benefits in the here and now, in our lives, in the lives of those around us, and in the lives of everyone we meet. Um, and it can be verified in this way, in this very life. So when there's this sort of argument that you see sometimes on social media, like, is Buddhism a, a philosophy or is it a religion or a way of life? I always like to say it's a path. It's a path. It's something on which we can take steps. And every step we take, we can know whether it's going in the right direction by where um, it's leading us, by the effect that we notice in our heart. Yeah. So the Buddha says that you can know it's the Dhamma and the Vinaya if it leads to peace, if it leads to dispassion. That's kind of coming out of clinging, right? Letting go of clinging, becoming more cool inside. He said, we can know it's the Dhamma if it leads to Nibbida, which is nowadays translated as revulsion. Quite a strong word. But what that really means is that we're turning our mind away from a path that leads to suffering and towards the path of peace. Yeah, we can know that it's the Dhamma if it's leading to insight, abhinya, to Sambodhi, enlightenment, and to Nibbana, the highest happiness. So, you know, when we meditate, if it's leading to more suffering, we are doing something wrong. And yet it is important that in order to understand suffering, we learn how to turn towards suffering in a wise and wholesome way. So this is all very good news because we can experience suffering in our bodies, in our minds quite readily, especially when things, you know, happen that we don't want to happen and uh, we're separated from people that we care about or we're associated with people that we don't really want to be around, right? The Buddha actually defined uh, these as um, the kind of sufferings that we experience in life and particularly the sort of psychological, emotional suffering that we can do something about. But he also spoke of existential suffering, just the very fact of being born, being alive, aging, sickness and death. And this kind of suffering, you know, is part and parcel of being a human being. And yet we can learn to understand um, the causes and to abandon those causes. So I expect that most people here probably already understand a little bit about the Four Noble Truths, but I just want to um, sketch them in brief before having a closer look at suffering and the path leading out of suffering, leading to the end of suffering. In other words, freedom, peace, um, and ultimately the highest happiness of Nibbana. So the Buddha said that all teachings in, in his um, doctrine, and I guess that would include 84,000 suttas that we have now, they can all be contained in the Four Noble Truths, just as all footprints of smaller animals can be contained in the elephant's footprint. You know, this is a much bigger footprint. So the Four Noble Truths encompasses basically the nature of our life. And the First Noble Truth is simply that there is suffering and that suffering is to be understood. 
So this is really important because some people think there's suffering and suffering is to be got rid of. And of course, that's true in the long run. But in order to actually be able to let go of suffering in a way that leads to wisdom and peace, we have to first of all get to know it. So I'm going to talk much more about that later on. The second noble truth is that there's a cause of suffering. What a relief. Because if there's a cause, we can actually eradicate that cause. You know, it means that it's not um, something permanent, something that we can't overcome. Anything that arises due to causes ceases when those causes come to an end. And he says that cause has to be abandoned, right? So with each of these noble truths, there's something we have to do. And that cause is clinging, craving, especially clinging to things which cannot last or bring um, lasting satisfaction. So any kind of clinging, and this can even mean to wholesome states of mind. As soon as this clinging comes in and we start to identify with what's arising, we kind of crush it. We crush the beauty and the grace of the Dhamma that arises, again, due to causes, not because we want it or when we want it. Right? So this clinging is always getting in the way. And then he said that there's an end of suffering and that end has to be realized. And the way to realize that is through basically letting go. And he talks about four ways of letting go, which I will weave into this talk. And then the last one is that there is a path to end that suffering. And this is why I say Buddhism is a path, really. And that is the beautiful Noble Eightfold Path. And this is to be developed. There's something we can do to develop and bring that path to fulfillment um, in our own heart, Bhave Tabam, to be developed. He further says that talking about the Four Noble Truths is very beneficial and he encourages it because it's relevant to the fundamentals of the holy life. And here he's referring to the holy life of monastics like myself, to the bhikkhunis and the bhikkhus, but really to any spiritual life. The Four Noble Truths are at the heart. And he says that by talking about that, again, it can lead to nibida, viraga, niroda, to peace, yeah, upasampada. Um, yeah, Upasampada. Oh, sorry, no, Upasama, that's right. Upasampada's ordination. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you secretly that you need to be ordained. <laughs> but the beauty of this path is that you don't actually have to um, ordain, but it should lead to that simplicity and that unloading of burdens so that the contentment, the meaning starts to come from within. And we need less and less in our um, material life. So since the Buddha said that it's good to talk about suffering, that's what we're going to do. And um, as I said, with the first noble truth, yeah, there's the truth um, of birth, aging, sickness and death, and also the existent, sorry, the um, psychological suffering from um, not getting what we want, you know, being associated with what we don't want um, and being separated from what we do want. This is all part and parcel of life. So this is quite normal. It happens to all of us. But there's also a lot of suffering that we add on to that, particularly when we regard that suffering as me and mine. And again, start clinging to it as something permanent and something we um, that's a problem for us. So we generally have two kinds of responses. The first one is to kind of repress anything that causes us to suffer. For example, emotions which are difficult or afflictive, we might uh, feel like, oh, you know, I'm a Buddhist, I shouldn't really get angry, so I better sort of swallow my anger and keep it inside, and we push it down into the conscious mind. Or we might feel that, like, it's not um, courageous to cry. In order to be strong, we've got to appear as though we have it all together, you know? We can keep it, we can keep calm, we can keep collected. And um, crying is a sign of weakness. But crying is not actually a sign of weakness. It's just a sign that you're in touch with your emotions. Of course, it can be a release. But then we can also quickly move into the opposite of repression, which would be to start rolling in these emotions. Yeah. So that's also not the middle path. So when we repress things, we tend to... Um, things tend to accumulate, you know, things remain unaddressed and they sort of roll on in the unconscious mind. And uh, psychologists sort of say that it has one of two results. It either implodes and causes you a lot of um, depression or even exhaustion, 
perhaps resentment and bitterness or it explodes onto other people <laughs> so it's almost like you've pushed all these feelings these emotions aside and buried them under a thick layer of concrete <laughs> and the sort of more smothered they feel the more they're going to try to come out and then one day something very small might happen to trigger you and that concrete gets a crack and whoosh, the whole thing explodes. And that's because we haven't been able to meet um, our emotions when they're arising, at the time they're arising. We haven't had the tools or the courage to do so. It's kind of like leaving your dishes in the sink for too long. You haven't been cleaning them, you know, when you should. So that food, that old yucky stuff gets stuck and congealed. And then you have to use like a really harsh scrubbing brush to get it off. But if through the practice we learn to meet however this experience is manifesting for us right now, then in a sense we're cleaning our mind, we're cleaning um, and purifying ourselves all the time. So the other problem, as I said, is when we suffer by wallowing or rolling or overexpressing um, negative emotions and cause a lot more suffering for others as well. And the problem with this is that we're actually too close um, to the suffering. We're too identified with it to be able to see that between ourselves and whatever experience arises, there is in fact a space, yeah? And it's within that space that we have the capacity to influence our emotions, our reactions, our attitudes towards the whole of life. So the Buddha talked about a wise response to suffering. And what is that wise response? It's not repression and it's not expression, but it's simply coming in contact with the reality of this moment as it manifests right now. It's not looking outside, not blaming others for the way we feel, but turning inward to find the causes of suffering within our own heart. And this is quite counterintuitive, especially if, you know, maybe you're sick or you have a lot of pain in your body. The last thing you want to do is actually take a closer look. You know, it feels as though by doing that, things might be magnified. But the Buddha's teaching is very radical and counterintuitive. Um, and he's actually saying that this is the way, the way out of suffering, in a, in a sense, is through, it's through meeting it. But like I say, the Buddha is very compassionate. And so he didn't just leave it at that. He actually said, you know, that we can uh, move into our inner world using the tools of the Eightfold Noble Path. So it's not just me and my mind that's got to kind of fight my way out. There's all these beautiful tools that the Buddha taught that we can um, use to help us travel into uh, a deeper understanding of ourself. So the first part of the path, as I'm sure you all know, is um, right view. And until we're stream enters, we none of us have right view. It's not a fully purified view because it always um, revolves around a sense of self. And that sense of self is where um, craving and aversion comes from. How can we crave? How can we be averse if there's no one there to be affected? Yeah? We crave because I... I'm lacking something, I need something, I need someone to make me happy. We're reversed because somebody's hurt me, somebody's hurtful words were about me and you know, it spoils my reputation or um, it's really not fair, you know, it goes against my self-image. So, um, but even before we're at the level of stream entry, there is such a thing as preliminary right view. Sometimes in the suttas it's called mundane right view. And this is just the simple understanding that there's suffering again, and that suffering has its cause. So that's the Four Noble Truths in brief, but also um, a basic understanding of the law of karma, at least so far as to realize that our actions of body, speech and mind do have effects. Yeah. And the quality of our intentions determines whether those effects will bring around happiness for ourselves and others, or pain and suffering for ourselves and others. It always depends on the intention of our mind. So the Buddha actually said um, that intention is karma because all thoughts and, and deeds arise from the motivation of the mind, the intention of the mind. 
yeah sometimes our um, acts of body and speech can be can appear quite clumsy even unskillful um but as long as they're motivated by kindness by compassion by letting go by doing our best um we're not actually creating unwholesome karma we're just um maybe a little bit immature in life and we have a bit more to learn about you know but that's looking at the details of life the buddha's always pointing us back to looking at where things are coming from so there's a nice quote by venerable tugton chodron that i wanted to share and she's a wonderful bhikkhuni actually in the tibetan tradition but she has a nice definition here about kama and what it actually means so she says, karma refers to our intentional, physical, verbal, and mental actions. What we do, say, and think. Our actions leave seeds on our mind stream, invisible potentials that can bring results in terms of what we experience in this and in future lives. Our habitual thoughts and behaviors and the environment and circumstances of our life. Our actions have an ethical dimension, and this is really important. Happiness comes from virtue, unhappiness from non-virtue. The Buddha doesn't reward or punish us. He's not a creator God. What we experience comes from our own minds, and so we are responsible for the causes we create. This being so, let's consider well our choices and decisions. So here when she's saying that we're responsible for the causes we create, I think this is very true, but it's also important not to take that heavily and not to feel like, oh my goodness, you know, there's so much that can go wrong. I've got to do this all on my own. Um, but rather to look at it in a positive light and say, okay, so if I can influence my own um, karma, then, you know, this is a really positive thing because I always have the possibility of adding more kindness, more compassion, more um, of a sense of letting go or making peace. And this is an ongoing practice. So sometimes at first when we come to the path, we actually think, oh my goodness, it's making me suffer even more because now I'm noticing what my mind's up to. But actually your mind was always behaving that way. It's just that you didn't know it. <laughs> so any moment of kindness, any moment of awareness, it's like putting on the brakes it's really powerful. It's much more powerful in a sense than all those moments of generating negativity because it's really going against the stream. And you're inclining your mind in, in wholesome ways. And after a while, the mind starts to understand, aha, this is where my benefit lies. So every moment that you can just, you know, soften around your experience, just, you don't have to be full of peace and bliss and loving kindness, but just, okay, can I just stay with this for a moment. And not only that, but how can I care? How can I care for this body and mind in this moment? Almost as though I was, were my own mother or elder sister. Everyone in this room right now is female, but I'm sure that when this talk is going out, then we have a whole range of different people. So it may be an older brother, an older sister, a teacher or a guide. How would they relate to what you're experiencing now? through their kindly eyes of non-judgment. And we can learn to look at our own experience this way. So this is how right view starts to turn into right intention, or Ajahn Brahm now translates that as right motivation, the second factor of the Eightfold Path. So these right motivations, as I said, are like the motivations of non-ill will, which is a synonym for loving kindness, the motivation of non um, cruelty or non-harming actually it's literally non-violence but this is a synonym for um, compassion yeah for caring for kindness and for harmlessness towards our own mind and then the other one is nekama which literally means renunciation but this means renouncing those things that are holding us down renouncing burdens taking off that heavy backpack from our back or at least taking out some of the stones that we carry in there so letting go doesn't mean just pushing things away it means first having a look at them is this useful or not and understanding that in some circumstances some things might be useful but in others we can put them down so I often like to translate upadana not as attachment 
but as uh, picking things up. Because in Buddhism, we talk a lot about being attached and attachment. But if you think about attachment, it's the opposite of attachment would be detachment. And I think that can carry quite a sense of coldness or being a little bit too aloof. Whereas actually the word upadana literally means taking things up. And then the opposite of that would be putting things down, right? Rather than detachment, it would be putting things down. So there's a lot more fluidity and flexibility in that. And we don't have to, you know, put things down forever. For example, when uh, monastics ordain, sometimes there's this idea that they'll be leaving their family behind. You know, they have to detach from their family as though they won't be able to have feelings for their family anymore. But actually, it's not that. I mean, you will be taking long periods of solitude and being in intensive retreat. And this year I had to tell my mom, I'm going to be in solitude for three months. I've got this wonderful opportunity to retreat in my own little place, which is where I am now, um, because I couldn't get to Perth to do my men's retreat with Ajahn Brahm as I would normally do. And um, but it was COVID time. And my parents are, you know, not so young anymore. My dad has leukemia, so he is in the vulnerable group. And I realized that, you know, taking that three months in should be a little bit hard on them. So I asked my parents, like, what would you like, you know, to feel secure? Would you like me to contact you a few times? And my mom was so sweet. She said, oh, maybe just in the middle, if we can just have a phone call halfway through. And so it was this lovely kind of, um, not even, I wouldn't say negotiation. It was more like um, just finding what fitted us both with a lot of respect for each other's situation. So she had the respect that this is important to have extended periods of silence, even though she doesn't really understand because she hasn't done that practice herself in solitude for long periods. But, um, and I understood that they may feel insecure if I'm suddenly not reachable. So I also said, you know, that they could call me if they really need to, um, but she didn't need to. And I think part of it was having that assurance in place that I'd give her that call, you know, six weeks in. And so this is an example of being able to put something down, but then pick it up when we need to. So that letting go is not an attempt to get rid of something, um, you know, the opposite of attachment, so-called attachment is not this cold and aloof detachment. It's actually just knowing, you know, how to make use of things which are healthy for us, which are helpful for us, and how to put aside, put down, and yes, sure, eventually let go of the things that are causing our minds to remain um, imprisoned. Yeah. So as we develop these three right intentions, they undermine their opposites, which are the ill will, the cruelty, and the sense desire. And uh, in the Majjhima Nikaya 19, it's the sutta on um, two kinds of thought. The Buddha actually says that thoughts that are motivated by those three right intentions cannot coexist with the opposite kinds of thoughts. So every time you have a thought of loving kindness, at that moment, the doors for ill will to enter are closed. Yeah. This is the power of the practice. You don't have to be like all blissed out and full of love every moment because I'm a Buddhist. That would be far too much pressure and would cause a kind of closing down. But at any moment we can have a thought, you know, oh, may this person be happy or, oh, this person's in pain. That's why they're speaking to me in that way. This person's suffering. Maybe there's something that I'm not aware of that they're going through right now. Yeah. It's the same for ourselves. Sometimes we find ourselves talking to ourselves very um, in irritated ways, like, for goodness sake, you know, for goodness sake, get it together. Come on, come on. You can do better than that. <laughs> and if somebody could take those words out of your mind and put them on a screen and show them to someone else, <laughs> you'd be quite embarrassed. And I can guarantee you probably wouldn't talk to a friend the way you sometimes talk to yourself. I mean, this goes for me too. I'm not free from negative thoughts towards myself. But what I notice is that the more I incline my mind towards loving kindness, towards kindness, compassion, letting go, the more likely wholesome, beautiful, uh, freeing thoughts are to arise in the mind. And the Buddha says in that same sutta that whatever we frequently ponder and reflect on, 
becomes the inclination of our mind. So through these right motivations, we're shaping our character. We're actually um, becoming uh, established in beautiful qualities of heart that are more and more likely to arise the more we practice. Every time, every time you cut that old habit, you know, you cut through that pattern of dysfunctional thinking, that is a moment of freedom, that is a moment of liberation, and that inclines your mind in wholesome ways. So it's no surprise then that during this um, noble path, the next step will be uh, right speech, right livelihood and right action. Because if we have learned to purify our motivation, then naturally, as, as a result of that, we will find wholesome ways to behave. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, at this point, our sila starts to really develop. So our inclination of mind starts to manifest in more and more virtuous behavior. So it's not enough anymore just to say, okay, I don't kill or I don't lie, I don't steal. It becomes much more positive and proactive so that instead of not killing, we actually start to take real care for life. And we actually start to, rather than just not taking or expecting what's not given, we start to develop in generosity and kindness. Rather than just not lying, we start to really ask ourselves, how am I feeling and why? And can I really speak from the heart about my experience, you know, without embellishing or exaggerating it? Um, can I use my speech in ways that bring people together, in ways that heal divisions, that actually uh, promote harmony? Yeah. So not only not lying, and can I also speak in a timely way, checking first whether a person's ready to hear some so-called constructive feedback, because we all like to give constructive feedback, right? But if it's not the right time, that constructive feedback actually becomes rather destructive. And once the words are out, it's too late to put them back. <laughs> so taking care of all of these things starts to develop what the Buddha called anavajrasukha, and that is a kind of blameless bliss in the mind. So this is when we start to recognize that there's a certain beauty, a certain type of peaceful joy that arises simply through not having remorse and regret for one's, uh, you know, misdeeds of speech and body. And you can go to sleep easy at night. You know, you can go to sleep feeling, yes, I've had a good day. I've done my best. We're not asked to be perfect. Yeah, this idea of perception, per perfection is um, I don't know where it comes from, maybe a romantic Western culture or something like that, or the love songs that we hear about my perfect person, everything will be fine <laughs> once we get together and life will be just wonderful. They never sing songs about arguing about the washing up. <laughs> you know, you never hear that, do you, in a, in a song? And as Ajahn Pham says, you never have photos on your wall about the divorce. You only have the photos of the marriage or the graduation. <laughs> You don't have photos of all those, you know, times that you've been slogging away at the computer. Even for me, if you could see me on my computer, you know, you'd think, goodness me, even the life of a nun can be, yeah, looking on the outside like being busy. But on the inside, it's coming from a place of service. It's coming from a place of virtue. And so we start to define our lives less by the quality of feeling that we have, whether we're feeling happy right now or joyful or elated and much more according to how values aligned our lives are and this is different it's not a kind of exciting happiness that's really short-lived it's a kind of quietness inside it's um, a sense of being at ease with one's own conscience um, yeah I remember even before I practiced Buddhism I used to say to my mom I just want to go to sleep knowing I've done my best that's what I want to do, you know. I just want to know that I've done my best. Because how can anybody do more than that? And sometimes our best is not as good as we'd like it to be. It's the best um, according to the conditions that we find ourselves in. Yeah? Even our decisions, we can think, oh, I made the wrong decision. But if you look carefully at where you were in your life at that time that you made the decision, you'll see that at that time, you only actually saw one or two options available to you. And you chose based on your own knowledge of life, 
your own knowledge of yourself at that time. So in that sense, you know, even our decisions, they can't really be wrong, but we can be informed step by step by the so-called mistakes on the direction we want to take in future. Now it's just the start of the new year and uh, it's a great time for just realigning our lives with our most uh, beautiful values, you know, our most um, valued intentions and really asking what do I want to take forward and what would be better left behind. Yeah. So this is about the virtue and it's very beautiful because you also notice that the more happiness that grows inside, the easier it is to be content with little. And the next part of the gradual training that the Buddha discusses in the Majjhima Nikaya number 51 is that one becomes content. And the analogy there is um, for a monastic. He says, just as a monastic would travel with uh, their bowl and their robes, their only burden. It's like the bird that flies with its wings, you know, without any luggage, just its wings. Um, and it's the same, whether you're a monastic or a lay person, you'll realize that you actually don't need as much as you thought. And I know some of you in Singapore, I do know that some people do have fairly simple lives, you know, you can downsize, you can come on retreats every year and spend a long time at Jhana Grove. And this is because you've learned to be content and, and you know now where to find happiness, right? in the bush <laughs> instead of in the city skyscrapers and the smog <laughs> but really it's about being inside isn't it that forest the beauty of jana grove is just um it's just a, a reminder of the peace and stillness in our hearts and i love australia for that there's such a sense of stillness in those forests you know unless it's the summer and you get some kind of hot wind blowing through it's actually incredibly still and uh, this really directs us to that stillness in our mind. And so from this um, sila, the next step in the Eightfold Path is actually right um, so-called effort. Ajahn Brahm now likes to um, translate that as endeavor. And I, I, I like that. He's going one step further and calling it right restraint. But I actually like endeavor more because part of this involves restraining ourselves from um, afflictive emotions or afflictive um, states of mind and not allowing them in in the first place um, and abandoning them if they have come in but the other part which is very beautiful and much more proactive is that we um, learn to allow the wholesome qualities in and once they've come in we maintain them we don't let them go so easily right so yeah there are some things we let go of but there are some things we treasure we value we don't cling we just give them attention, we tend to them, we notice them, and we bring them up in our mind. So it's like when you're meditating and you may be with the breath, or you may be just observing your body sensations, and you start to feel, well, this is quite nice. And sometimes at first it looks fairly ordinary, it looks like, yeah, it's just breath, there's not that much peace there. But I was meditating once at Dhammasara, and um yeah, I, I sort of appreciated that my mind was quiet and the breath was very calm. And then I remembered this instruction from my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. Notice peace. That was all. And suddenly the peace just grew <laughs> and kind of took over my mind. It was really almost magical. And it wasn't that suddenly there was more peace in my mind. It was just that suddenly I was seeing what was there instead of looking for something that wasn't there in the next moment or you know something according to my imagination my fantasy of peace so sometimes you know just turning towards these wholesome qualities any amount of peace contentment even pleasure in the body or mind um, can help to cultivate maintain and develop that beautiful state of mind and I notice, I mean, I'm not like a John Brown, you know, just like total meditation master, <laughs> as if he was born that way. He doesn't like anyone saying that. But, you know, he clearly has a gift for deep meditation. And this, you know, was there in his life, um, even as a lay person. Um, so sometimes, you know, I'll be meditating during my uh, retreat this year. And the bliss would be there and I'd be feeling great. And, and then I noticed that moving from that into my next activity, sometimes I wasn't taking care to really preserve that state of mind. It's as though you can start to take things for granted and you just move into the next thing a little bit too fast. 
and you don't take the time to linger, you know, to just linger and recognize that, oh, a lot of letting go has happened. Let me not just, you know, sort of even sabotage, that's a strong word, but let me not just compromise that so quickly by moving on too fast. So we start to be able to tune into something that's a much subtler kind of happiness. And um, this is part of sense restraint. Sense restraint and right endeavor are almost synonymous and they come at the same place in the gradual training after the sealer of body and uh, speech. So the sense restraint is more like purifying our mental sealer, our mental virtue and learning to use our minds in ways that increase and encourage the wholesome states. So Ajahn Brahmali is really the expert on these things and he gives whole retreats on um, the gradual training, really staying a long time with sense restraint. Um, and even sense restraint, I find it a slightly strange word. I like to think of it more as guarding the senses, guarding them. So that involves protecting and that involves just noticing like, what the outside objects and the contact with the outside objects, what effect they're having on my mind, what kind of thoughts are arising in response, and can I, you know, gently influence those thoughts in a more wholesome way? So I really like this idea of guarding because it's close to mindfulness as the gatekeeper who sort of checks, you know, is it the enemies or the friends who are trying to come in? So for example, you might see somebody and it might be the person you live with or, it might be somebody who's irritated you in the past. And as soon as you see them, you're just carrying this kind of echo of the past, this idea that they're irritating in some way. And if you have developed sort of a, a fixed judgment and you think, oh, it's when they do this or say this, or even their, I don't know, their mouth moves in a certain way, it can be such small and petty things. You're almost expecting to get irritated by that. So you're kind of like on the alert for the things that make you um, annoyed. <laughs> and this doesn't give us, again, very much space to move. But as our mindfulness starts to increase, we can catch it. We can catch ourselves expecting the worst. And we can instead open up the field of our perception and say, OK, this person may have this quality that irritates me, but they also have so many good attributes. They also did this or said this or you helped me at that time when I was in trouble whatever it is that you can see in that person. The point is that however we perceive, until we're purified, our perception is always a little bit off course. It's never an accurate perception according to reality. So we might as well use our perception in ways that lead to wholesome states. Yeah, We can play. Even if we feel we're exaggerating someone's wholesome states, doesn't matter as long as that's leading to you, for you, to more and more inner peace, more and more happiness and compassion within yourself and obviously for the other person as well. So I want to go through the whole path. So I'll just speak for another five or 10 more minutes to talk a bit about um, right mindfulness because in the gradual training, right mindfulness only happens now. So it's interesting because through the rest of our cultivation, establishing you know, a modicum of right view, establishing the wholesome motivations of kindness, compassion and letting go, and learning about sila, the effects of our body, speech and mind, and how to incline them in wholesome ways, we already have quite a lot of happiness. We have the blameless bliss that arises through virtue, and we also have something called unblemished bliss, um, abhyase karasukha, from sense restraint. And it's only at this point that the Buddha actually says one should go into an empty place under a tree um, on a bed of straw or whatever it is and sit cross-legged to establish mindfulness in front of one. So it's only at this point. So if you imagine, it's almost like you've already put your dishes through the pre-wash <laughs> before you now go under the tree to put them in the dishwasher. <laughs> So you're not going into your meditation sitting with lots of coarse defilements. Your hindrances have already been um, restrained. They've already been weakened, but they've not been fully overcome. So it's like those plates that have already been like washed of the coarser dirt and food. 
but there's still a little bit more to do. So you're going to meditate and it shouldn't be too difficult at this point. So at this point in the suttas, there are different um, orders and sequences for developing samadhi or mindfulness. So in the Majjhima Nikaya 51, um, from sitting down under the tree, we go straight to our breath. We go straight into Anapanasati, which is the Buddha's own preferred method of meditation. And it's the method that you may have all learned with Ajahn Brahm. And so the hindrances, as I say, are mostly overcome to the extent that it becomes quite easy to stay with the breath. You don't have to fight with the breath. You don't have to keep on chasing it because it didn't want to stay with such a cruel control freak. (laughs) You actually invite the breath in. And the breath wants to be with you because your mind's full of kindness and full of peace. So when the breath comes in, it's almost like, oh, there's a pillow now for my mind. I can rest my head on this breath. I can let the breath hold the mind. Isn't that a nice perception? I love that perception when my mind's ready, you know, that I can just let the breath hold the mind. I don't have to hold the breath. So this is one way. And from there, once you're with the breath, the PT starts to arise, the, um, the bliss or the rapture that comes through purifying the mind, that comes through letting go. So here we're actually practicing the third noble truth, not the cause of suffering, not clinging and wanting jhanas and enlightenment, but actually letting go of that through, um, through gradually making peace with whatever arises. Yeah. So the joy starts to arise. And at this point, you'll notice that the more you're able to let go and accept that joy, the more it keeps on building, the more it keeps on building. And whenever you come back and say, oh, now what? Oh, what's going to happen next? It recedes. It recedes because you're starting to cling. The sense of self is coming back. In a sense, you're like interrupting the natural process that's already been set in course, set in motion. So in this way, and in this sutta, the Buddha talks about um, going into these deep states of meditation. And at that point, when the mind is completely free from hindrances after the deep jhana experiences, one has an opportunity to see things as they are. And at this point, one can practice the satipatthana, so to speak, but it happens quite naturally. Um, And one can actually penetrate the impermanent nature, the non-self and suffering nature of this whole body mind yeah so this is one way but there's another way and that's in the um danta bhumi sutta one two eight i think in the majjhima nikaya and this is where after sitting down and establishing mindfulness we practice with the satipatthana so this is what you get when ajahn brahm first starts you off with the body yeah body awareness um we start to come in contact with vedana vedana anupasana and we start to learn a little bit about the nature of this body and mind. And again, this helps undermine the hindrances. And over time, your mind will become stiller and you'll gradually um, learn to experience the stillness of the mind. So it can start either before or after jhana. There's really a pre-jhana satipatthana and there's a post-jhana satipatthana. And the difference is the depth of wisdom that can arise. So it's almost like the deeper the stillness, the deeper the wisdom, the deeper the wisdom, the deeper the stillness. It's a spectrum and the two kind of dance around each other. So this is different for different people. And in my personal journey, I started with Satipatthana practice. We used to do a bit of breath meditation, but it was the kind of breath meditation where you'd be chasing and dragging in the breath. So I never enjoyed that. And I was actually really relieved when we could start observing our body and our sensations because there was so much more space for the mind. And it just seemed a lot more interesting to me because my mind wasn't ready to watch the breath. So through observing the sensations and the arising and passing away, my mindfulness got very strong. But after several years, like, let's see, 15 or 16 years of practice and about six years or four years as a non, I realized that it was only getting to a certain depth and it wasn't going the whole way. And to deepen my wisdom, I would need to deepen the samadhi. So as I say, it's different for everyone, but you can almost imagine like that samadhi is like sharpening the knife. A knife is not a nice analogy because knives are sharp, but they have their uses, right? And in this case, the sharp knife 
is useful because it can cut through delusion much more effectively, much more quickly. If you're using a blunt knife, it's like, yeah, you see the delusion, you see your hindrances, but it's not that clear as to how they arise. So the knife's too blunt and we sharpen that knife through the process of samadhi. And lastly, because we're going to have to end up, <laughs> um, the Buddha also talks about practicing the Brahma Viharas as a way to deep wisdom and as a part of this gradual training. So the four Brahma Viharas of metta, karuna, compassion, mudita, joy, and equanimity are also ways into the four jhanas. And they also result in deep wisdom arising because they've purified the mind from the hindrances, especially the hindrance of ill will. Because the Brahma Viharas are particularly pleasant abidings the abidings of the Brahmins, right? So very, very sublime states. And in all cases, however we approach things, we learn to see the body and mind as non-self. So the whole purpose of the Satipatthana is to direct the mind onto those areas of existence where we assume a sense of self. Either we assume that we are our body or that we are our feelings it sounds funny to say we are our feelings, but how many times do you say, I am sad, I am depressed? No? How about, oh, depression has arisen, or I experience depression, I experience sadness. But we're so identified with our moods. And so we look in these areas, yeah, feelings, mind, and mental contents, and we see that they are all causally arisen. And they're all passing away, changing constantly all the time. You know, you can't hang on to it even for a moment. It's just constantly arising and passing away. And when we see that things are arising and passing, it makes no sense to cling, right? Why cling to something that is by nature passing away? You're just giving yourself a really hard job. You're hurting your hand and you're going to burn out. You're gonna, it's going to lead to exhaustion, isn't it? because it can't be done. And so this hand, this hand of clinging starts to loosen, starts to loosen up and starts to learn to just receive the Dhamma, just start to receive, you know, the natural wisdom that's available to us when our minds are free enough to receive it. And it's beautiful to be around, you know, people like Ajahn Brahm. And my first teacher also was a very um, noble monk. I've been incredibly blessed in my life. And what you can see when there is that um, understanding of non-self is that it doesn't make people um, kind of bland or numb or empty or void. What tends to happen instead is that that delusion gets replaced by love and kindness. It's almost like because the defilements have left the mind, those beautiful qualities of the four Brahma Viharas can enter in. And someone like Ajahn Brahm, he's just running on loving kindness and compassion and equanimity and joy. That's what he does, you know. It's not coming from a sense of craving. If you told him, okay, really, don't teach now for however long. Great, you know, <laughs> great. Can't wait to get into his cave. So it's not coming from a neediness or a need to be liked or famous or any of that, which, of course, you all know. But what does motivate it? What motivates him is just these Brahma Viharas. They take over you know, and almost replace a sense of self. So it's incredibly beautiful to see where this path can lead. But the good news is that suffering is not um, a disaster. It's not a sign that anything's gone wrong. Suffering can actually be a cause for happiness. Suffering has a purpose because it shows us how and where we cling, how and where we can start removing the causes of suffering and we can start walking on the path of peace, yeah? So that helps me to embrace my suffering and it also helps me incline towards the beautiful, pure qualities of heart. And this path is, you know, beneficial in the beginning, middle and end. That means any moment of awareness, any moment of kindness, you're cutting through your own suffering and you're finding a moment of freedom and drop by drop, the jar is full. Mm -hmm. Drop by drop, we keep on adding to our pot of beautiful qualities and eventually that jar just overflows. It's like the reservoir bursts open 
and just generates loving kindness into this world for all to share. So I think that's all from me. And um, I believe some of you might have questions. Thank you, Venerable Chanda, for a wonderful talk. Can we all say sadhu three times? <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Venerable. Uh, does anybody welcome. have any questions? Um, maybe, Venerable Chanda, may I ask a question, please? Please, uh, yes. I've often heard that um, karma is um, habits, is uh -huh. born of habitual, uh, 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 habitual actions. Um, but for me, like, habitual actions is like, um, like maybe um, biting my fingernails. Or, so how, how is that karma? I don't understand the relationship. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, karma is something that's really profound and difficult to understand unless we're all stream enterers. Um, and I think... I wouldn't necessarily say karma is habits, but I think that okay. karma can lead to habits because as the Buddha says, you know, whatever we frequently reflect and ponder upon, whatever becomes, you know, a habitual way of thinking or doing something becomes the inclination. So, right. I, I mean, I think that the karma is more at the level of intention than action. So right. maybe having a look at where that habit is coming from might be more helpful than thinking that that habit is karma in and of itself. I would say that the biting the nails is more likely the effect of certain inclinations of mind. So right. perhaps it happens when, I don't know, when there's some subtle fear or anxiety there, and perhaps you're not aware of that feeling or you've learned to sort of almost um, replace that feeling by this action of biting the nails. So it may not be that. It may be boredom. It may be restlessness. But if you actually see if you can trace it back and look at that point before you uh, bite the nails and notice what's happening in your mind right there, and just noticing that it's like it's like you're just stopping the habitual energy for a moment long enough to see what's going on without judgment, without sort of telling yourself, don't bite your nails no matter what, because biting your nails is not harming anyone. And as long as you're not biting them like completely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would just suggest that looking at where that's coming from, contacting your body, contacting your feelings in the body and see if there's an emotion underpinning that. Thank you, thank you, Venerable. So, so it's more like a, a intentional um, part of our what we do that we do habitually that creates that sort of um, imprint that is our karma. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's more that the intention is the karma, as in the seed, uh, okay. and that seed can manifest in different ways. So that could manifest. Say, if nervousness or anxiety is behind biting the nails. That's the karma, that's the karmic seed. Um, and it will produce effects in different ways. So for you, it might turn into biting the nails. For someone else, it might turn into getting annoyed with someone. For someone else, it might turn into um, palpitations or heartbeat increases. And that might be more like the effect. But then in that moment, when that happens, you also have a chance to make karma with that moment. So that's what Ajahn Brown calls making good meditation karma. So, mm -hmm. It's not so important always to know why and how. Sometimes it's just enough to know, okay, this is what's happening now. What am I, how am I relating to what's arisen in this moment? Because this is also where you're creating newcomer. So if you relate to biting your nails with kindness, with acceptance, with forgiveness, or maybe with letting it be, as in, you know, you stop biting the nail, then you're making newcomer. You're making new pathways in the mind. Does that, that make sense? Good. Yes, it does. It does. It does. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, does anybody else have uh, any questions? Yeah, I have a question, um, Venerable. Um, so my question would be, um, knowing that one, when one goes through suffering, um, it's, it's actually an opportunity to, to look into oneself to understand what it causes and then trying to mindfully overcome that suffering. But how do you, how do you, um, if, if let's say 
there is a certain behavior or someone who 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 keeps repeating the behavior and and, and is causing um, you to or want to suffer and and uh, repeatedly how how do you yeah. sustain how do you sustain that mindfulness not not to be uh, affected or, or overcome with yeah. aversion for such a person for example <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, great question. Um, I think it's really important, first of all, to redefine our relationship with suffering and to frame it more as learning to meet the suffering rather than learning to overcome the suffering. Because sometimes when we want to overcome it, we actually miss a step. We actually miss um, turning toward it and learning how to handle it learning how to meet it with kindness, learning how to meet it with understanding in ourselves, yeah? So the wanting to overcome it can actually sometimes have um, traces of aversion in there. And it is important to learn to um, move toward things that are causing suffering within ourselves and find out what's going on inside. So I would say at that time, if you're suffering because of somebody else's behavior, you're the first person who needs attention. So having a look at how you're feeling and meeting those feelings, not only with mindfulness and awareness, but with a lot of compassion and kindness as well. And so not only asking, okay, how do I feel, but also how can I care for this feeling right now? And sometimes that might mean contacting a lot of pain. And it might mean that you will, you know, initially feel even more sadness but you'll be contacting your emotions and allowing them to breathe, so to speak. And from there, it'll be much clearer as to what is needed in the outside world. I mean, you might find that there's so much sorrow and, you know, um, sadness underneath the anger and irritation that, um, yeah, sometimes that in itself can be a release. Or it might mean that you then are able to approach that person in a very different way in a much more soft and vulnerable way, maybe actually talk to them about how it's affecting you, how it's making you feel. Or it sometimes may be that you realize this is really not doing me any good and I need to move away. You know, the Buddha didn't say that we should just put up with suffering. He showed us where to look and how to understand suffering. But he didn't say just suffer. He said, you know, association with the wise is an important part of the path. So if you've changed your attitude, if you've done everything you can to be kind, if you've you know, really tried to make peace with the situation and it's still not working, then I would say sometimes we do have to make a change in our life. Yeah. Does that help or answer sufficiently or is there any more to that? Yes, thank you so much, Venerable. Thank okay. you. I have a question related to, to the word suffering. Yeah. When I started Buddhism 15, 20 years ago, uh, the word suffering was very hard in a way. Yeah. And I didn't understand exactly what suffering meant. In my ignorance, I said, well, I don't suffer. But of course <laughs> I did. Yeah. And I wonder, this is a, when we start out on the Buddhist path, if the word suffering is a little bit too strong for us, that it could turn us off a bit uh-huh. rather than soften it and maybe explain a little bit differently, especially mm-hmm. for us, for the people who are new. Okay. Yeah, good question. And I noticed at the beginning of my talk, I was saying the word suffering again and again, suffering, suffering, suffering. And after a while, I thought, ooh, this could be heavy. (laughs) Um, It's interesting because I actually have the opposite experience. In my life, if the Buddha would have said things are unsatisfactory, I'd have thought, that doesn't cut it for me Um, because I suffered. You know, I really suffered and I I felt the suffering of the world. And I can't think of another word to explain it other than suffering. (laughs) So for me, that word was very good. Um, But I know that some people translate it as unsatisfactoriness, some people translate it as stress, and I think they're all valid in different ways in different contexts. Um, I would say like when you look at his actual definition for what he means by dukkha, um, 
when you look at, you know, suffering or dukkha is birth, aging, sickness and death. I wouldn't say that that is unsatisfactory. I would say that sickness and death is suffering. I think unsatisfactory wouldn't cut it there because it's actually a disaster to be born and to die and to be born and to die. It's actually something we want to avoid. <laughs> but then when you look at other parts of that definition, you know, like um, association with the dislike, separation from the like, not getting what you wish for. Yeah, perhaps that might make you suffer, but it also depends how you relate to it. So the idea here, though, is that even if you get what you wish for, it's not actually satisfying it's not actually going to fulfill you completely. So I do think in that sense, we could say unsatisfactory. I think for me, unsatisfactory would relate more to the sensual world, like sensuality, because some people think that that's happiness um, and that that's something worth pursuing. And the Buddha did say there's a gratification, you know, in the pleasure of the senses. But one thing you can say to people, even if they don't suffer from that, you can at least try to point out that it's unsatisfactory. It's not really deeply nourishing or lasting happiness. So in that context, I do think the word unsatisfactory would be more appropriate than suffering. But I mean, I've suffered, you know, after, say, being in a relationship, obviously, a long time ago, and then it breaks up or it's just not. I mean, I actually found it was suffering even in it because I actually wanted to ordain. So I thought, my goodness, what's happened here? Now I have to, you know, untangle myself from this. This was six years before I ordained, so I was only like 23 or something. Um, but I felt it as a kind of, I felt even the pleasant sensations as a kind of intoxicating um, feeling. It felt agitating. It felt um, like I was becoming dependent. <laughs> but it might be that everybody's a bit different. So, I mean, whilst I do think that you've got a point there, I kind of think to reduce it too much and to take away the word suffering would lose a lot of the impact of this path. Because I really think that a lot of people coming to the Buddha Dhamma are quite desperate and really searching for an answer to the things that have happened in their lives. Um, so, yeah, I think you've got a point, though. And I think, you know, we can use um, different words for the word suffering, depending on the context, for sure. I don't know. Would you like to comment any further on that? Because it's a really interesting point. Um, not really. I think basically when people are starting on the Buddhist path, I think the word suffering could be a problem. And also, we're all operating in different languages. So suffering is in English. And I, in Norwegian, the word would be absolutely horrifying. Oh, really? Yes. Ah. And if so I, it could and be a translation problem as well. Not only for me, but I think for many people, you know, we, there's so many different people listening to, mm -hmm. to the word suffering. And we all come from different languages where that word could be translated into different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I yeah. I, I, I have no problem seeing where you're coming from. And I have gradually also learned as I have come along as well on the path what suffering really is. But in those early days, I was, you know, high nosed and said, well, I don't suffer. Yeah. But it was. Because I was, but I didn't know yeah. it. Yeah, sure. But this is the thing. I don't think you can change the word to bring people on before they're ready. Because I think that it's suffering in people's lives that tends to bring them to the path. You know, it tends to be when we feel like we've explored every other option and it hasn't worked, that we actually take a serious interest in the Dhamma. I mean, it's true that if you, you're coming just because it seems kind of interesting or maybe it can help you a little bit or it's a nice thing to do, maybe, you know, it's enough just to hear that, oh, mindfulness is helpful in living a life and being more healthy and, and things like that. But I think, yeah, generally speaking, the more we appreciate suffering to some extent, the more seriously we're going to take to the path. I mean, if you speak to most monastics, there was something kind of, it's quite, it takes something to give up your whole life. It takes some sort of depth of understanding of suffering that I don't think would come about through changing that word completely. But it's interesting because now you say that in Norwegian, it's such a horrible word. It's not in English, I don't think. It's kind of something that we all 
in England anyway, everyone suffers because we always moan about the weather. So that's suffering in and of itself. <laughs> Just the grey sky is suffering, you know. <laughs> but maybe you should talk with Bhante Sajato and ask him, um, yeah, d offer a different word for the Norwegian translations. Could be. Hmm. I don't That's know, has anybody, has anybody else anything to say about that? It's really an interesting subject. Uh, I, I think that, um, uh, yes, when you first started, when people do first start out, it might be a problem thinking that Buddhism is a pessimistic religion. But mm -hmm. when they go into it, then they realize that actually just focusing on the suffering is to ignore a large part of the Buddha's path, which yeah. is to bring you out of suffering. So yeah. I think that is important. Um, but um, uh, as, as, as with Sister Helen, as I uh, grew on the path, I didn't grow very big. I take baby steps. <laughs> but as, as I started to understand more, I realized that it wasn't just suffering. It was it was um, more dissatisfaction as well. And the Buddha also taught that um, this sort of dissatisfaction was even at the level of uh, uh, very, very subtle levels, even in the level of your mind, like the five clinging aggregates, your thoughts, you know, your thoughts fueled by clinging. It was that subtle to that little degree. So then I realized that, yes, there's big suffering like sickness and death. There's definitely big suffering. But he was also talking about the very subtle layers of dissatisfaction so you know yeah. as we go on the buddhist path we sort of learn more and more about this word dukkha so it's, yes it's very interesting mm. so just just to share my comment yeah thanks thanks yeah it is really interesting and you're reminding me now that the buddha does say that suffering is to be understood parinyatabam it means completely in every um, dimension yeah. of that suffering yeah. and that ultimately even states like loving kindness are ultimately a kind of suffering because they still end. And even while we're experiencing them, we're still experiencing something. So in that sense, you could say that the five khandas are afflictions. In fact, he does use that yeah. word in the Anattalakana Sutta that they are um, afflictions because basically they're agitations on the mind. Yes, and I think, true. yeah, the more the more peaceful, the more peace we experience in our meditation, the more we realize it later. Like sometimes you think, oh, this is fun. Thinking is fun, especially if I'm on a certain train yeah. of thought. It's yeah. actually quite fun. But then if you've been like quiet and free from thinking for a long time, the first thought that comes is like, ding, it's like an impingement on the peace. And so we yep. start to get a taste for subtler and subtler and subtler experience. It's like we're kind of weaning off, um, I don't know, like ice cream or kind of really intense flavors and sugar and oil. Because as you know, I'm on um, the trustee of an Anukampa and uh, I always like to listen to uh, Venerable. So I thought I could be a moral support. Oh, that's fantastic. Then, um, then Sister Helen, can I invite you to um, talk a bit about the, um, the Bikuni, the Anukampa Bikuni project? Because here in Singapore, we don't know much about it. So what, what is, why is it? Uh... She's going to try and defer to me. No, Helen, you do it. <laughs> Welcome back, Venerable. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I, I must have lost my connection. Did that spoil the talk? Not at all. Oh, not at all. <laughs> That's good. Um, Anukampa Bikuni Project is the first Bikuni monastery in England. And it started back in 2016. And I was invited by Venerable Chanda to join as a trustee, which I did with great gratitude and also gratitude to Ajahn Brahm. I have known Venerable Chanda since 2012 when we met in uh, Janagrav. I live in Portugal, so I cannot be hands on in the daily run of the monastery where Venerable is right now. But I'm finding it a very, very interesting project. I think the project is going very well. And Venerable Chanda has 
made a very great name for herself, becoming a great teacher, and has actually opened the door for herself to get a lot, a lot of invitations and making the project very well known, not only in the UK, but I think also now worldwide. Uh, the virus has had one advantage, and that is that we can all meet on Zoom. And that Zoom also opens the door for other people to join from all over the world. And we have seen on Venerable Zoom that uh, people are getting up early in the morning from Los Angeles to join in. So it's obvious that uh, the Word on the Camper project will is getting better known around the world. And we also hope then that we can increase some of the donations coming in. It's not so easy to buy a property in the UK without a little bit of money. And of course the property needs to be fairly, not overly big, but fairly accommodating at least Venerable Chanda and another Bikuni, and also hopefully one or two Anagarikas in the future. So well, I think we're doing very well. And of course the COVID did put a little stop to it this year and have left Vulnerable very isolated. But um, things move around along and we are not, we are very optimistic and we're all hard working towards creating the goal of the first Bikuni Monastery Training Center in UK. I think that's good enough, hope so. That's that's very good. That's very good. Thank you. Uh, so so it's more like a, a, a building project, or is it more like a getting more bikunis type of um, uh, project? Shall I answer? Yeah. Okay. So, Anukampa is a UK charity, and we have right. two aims. So the first aim is to um, promote the teachings of early Buddhism in an authentic and accessible way. So that is around the teaching that we offer. And obviously we invite Ajahn Brahm over here once a year and Ajahn Bumali also teaches for us and some other bhikkhunis as well, like I am Ananda Bodhi and whoever um, we invite and whoever's willing to support us in that way. So um, that's one of the aims. And I think we're doing really, really well with that. We have a YouTube channel, Anukampa Bhikkhuni Project YouTube. Right with hundreds of talks actually by myself and Ajahn Brahm. It's the one resource that people don't know where there's a lot of Ajahn Brahm talks that you won't have heard of. So we wanna get more traffic into that. Um, and yeah, we have live events with him every year outside of COVID time, of course. Um, and then the second part of the project is to establish a monastery, which will be like a forest monastery. So something like Dhammasara, but on a much smaller scale. One of the reasons is we don't have bush like that <laughs> at all. And as Helen said, you know, things are very expensive over here. But um, the idea is to have a place where women can come and train towards the full ordination, because at the moment in England, there, there is no opportunity for that. The only monasteries are in the Thai forest tradition, in the Theravada. The only Theravada monasteries are like the other branches of Wat Pa Pong, who made a very clear decision not to support the ordination of bhikkhunis. And so women still ordain there and there's quite a thriving community. But it seems to me that at a certain point in their um, monastic life, they need more autonomy, they need more of a sense of responsibility, they need to be able to make decisions about how to develop their own monastic community of nuns. And as long as they're only officially novices, they don't have that kind of independence. And so Ajahn Brown's always been a big champion for gender equity mm. and wants women to step up into leadership roles. And of course, you know, the bhikkhuni training is our training inherited by the Buddha mm. um, for a purpose, you know, because the Buddha laid down uh, the bhikkhuni training because it's the most effective path towards enlightenment. And so I personally believe that, you know, we can be enlightened as lay people or as, or as monastics, but people need a choice. People should have and deserve a choice. And so I want to bring that option to people that there is a place they can come and train towards the full ordination should they wish in a community with other women. And I wanna say at this point that the monastery will not only be for women, it's not only a training monastery, okay. it will be a place where people can come and stay. So 
I'll be able to invite the Singaporeans, men, women, and gender non-binary people. We're very friendly to anyone from any background, any race, any sexual orientation. People suffer. People desire their happiness. And so that's what we want to provide. Teddy bears can come too. <laughs> I see a teddy bear there and um, so you know it'll be obviously a smaller scale than um, Bodignana but over the long term we hope it will grow so right now we're sort of in limbo because we can't really move to a bigger property because I'm alone so I need more trainees and people on the ground with me to support my monastic needs and to free me up from a lot of the admin and the managerial side of the project so that I can actually train and teach um and also we need to keep on raising funds because as helen said like for a four or five bedroom house anywhere within a couple of hours from london it's going to cost much over a million pounds so unfortunately that's the british economy um but we're keeping our eye out you know and we're, we're still um looking around so i think within the next couple of years we'll probably uh, find a bigger place but for now I have a place in Oxford where we um, can welcome guests it's four bedrooms and so I have place but obviously this year people couldn't come due to Covid but before Covid we always had guests like there was a constant flow of guests and we could have a very simple monastic schedule whereby there was some service in the morning and then the afternoons were for solitude and meditation so small steps but very significant steps as well. So thank you oh, for asking. Yeah. Thank you. That, that is, uh, I think that's fantastic for our Singapore audience to know um, because many of us are still unaware. I think ah, that's, yes, good, yes. Good, yeah, good. Yeah, very, yes, all the best, all the best, Venerable. Um, thank you. Well, Sister Teddy Bear, ask a question now, please. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I want to ask another question. Um, do you have like, <laughs> do you have enough like food and supplies and medicine oh. at your end? That is so kind. Thank you so much for asking. You know, another amazing thing about the COVID situation was that, um, well, at first I wasn't sure how I would be fed. Um, but there were two or three women in the local area who offered to do some shopping for me once in a while. But then it came to the point where I think two or three, maybe all of them sort of dropped out. And so we had to find a new way to do it. And it was great because um, because we've been doing a lot of teaching online, like I do weekly or thrice weekly teachings online. Um, we presented this opportunity for people who come to our talks to be involved. And um, so now we have a roster whereby every week somebody sends a weekly shop and also a vegetable box. So that is delivered to me here. And it's meant that we've reached uh, more people. And also you have to remember that England is not a Buddhist country. So many of these people have never really offered food to a monastic before, and they haven't really understood the whole system of, um, you know, reciprocity and giving and generosity. But now they've started to get a feel for it. And I feel so delighted because every time somebody offers a shop, they get really excited about it and they, they feel a lot of joy um, being able to support. And so, yeah, I've got plenty of food. The thing is that I haven't got um, people coming daily to offer cooked food. So sometimes I have to do it myself, but I've checked with Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali and there is a Vinaya allowance for that in times of danger and um, difficulty. So that's the one we use, the Buddha said, in that situation, monastics can cook. So I do that and I make just a simple meal, um, remembering that it's all been offered from all these amazing supporters. So, yeah, thank you for asking. We do have um, food, but anybody who wants to, I mean, you can always write to our team and offer to do a weekly shop. I think even from Singapore, it's possible, most probably. There's a way to do it. Um, and what we also always need is like long term committed volunteers. So ideally people who live a bit closer, but there may be admin or technical or design um, things that people could do. So we do have an email address. You can write to us for any further information. Team at anukampaproject.org. Oh, thank you so much. That's really, really lovely.
I feel quite honoured to be, um, you know, to be invited by you all because I know what a hardworking and committed Dhamma practitioners you all are and, you know, your deep respect for Ajahn Brown as well. So uh, it's, it's felt like a very special uh, time. And I think Sis Engchin got a last question for you. Sure. Uh, yes, the Honorable. Uh, following Kim's question on karma, if everything is impermanent, how does karma work? Because karma will also be impermanent. Yes, correct. Karma is impermanent and that's why we can be free. Because if karma was permanent, there'd be no way out. So um, karma is not only impermanent, it also um, arises depending on the quality of our mind. So there's a beautiful sutta called the salt crystal and it's in the Anguttaras. I forget exactly where. I think it's in the Anguttara threes. And it actually says that if kama was always experienced exactly as it was produced, so if you did something and it would always result in an equal effect, there would be no living of the holy life because there would be no way to free ourselves from those effects. But he said it's like if the results of past karma arise in a mind which is small and tight and contracted. It's like putting a salt crystal in a glass of water. The glass of water becomes very, very salty. In other words, that karmic result has a big impact. But if you put that salt crystal in a lake, it doesn't leave much taste at all. You can't even discern that salt. And that is similar to like, you've done something in the past which maybe wasn't very skillful, but when the result arises, it arises in a mind that's full of compassion. It's full of other wholesome qualities and it's diluted by that, it's diluted. So the impact will not be so strong. And I had my own experience of this. Something happened to me which was quite traumatic. And whenever I used to remember it, especially in the early days, I'd get very upset. You know, it could trigger anxiety or whatever. But then about a year later, I was doing a lot of metta practice and um, I was focusing on sending metta to my best friend and the metta was really getting going across about 10 days. And during that time, I remembered this other person that had hurt me and it just had no impact on my mind. It was like it just landed in such a soft and expansive and, and loving space that there was no suffering that arose in that time. And since that time, I can talk about what happened. I can talk about this person without any um, anxiety, fear, anger, or regret arising in my mind. It doesn't re-traumatize me anymore. So, I mean, that might not be exactly what the Buddha meant, but that was one of the experiences which helped me understand that sutta. To see that we always have the possibility to create good karma now. And if we can let go of the unwholesome effects of our body and speech you know for example not keep on remembering all the things you've done wrong not keep bringing it up in your mind then it will just be kind of overshadowed by the goodness it won't have that much effect so i don't know if that answers the question or if that's slightly a tangent to the question um, yes, but then you see, is sometimes uh, things happen that is um, not very good. People will say, "Oh, it's because of your of your past karma." Yeah. Okay. So karma will not. No, it's not. It's not. Um, it's not impermanent. It's, it comes back to you. How do you explain well, that? Okay. Well, first of all, when they say that, that is actually um, they don't know that because not everything that happens to us is a result of past karma. The Buddha talked about about seven causes for things that arise in the present. And only one of those things is past karma. So things also arise in the present because of um, carelessness, because of weather, because of accidents, because of um, imbalances in the body. So the Buddha listed all these different things and or they could be arising because of past karma, but we can't really be sure. So I would say it's unfortunately something that is heard quite a lot among Buddhists and also amongst sort of people from other religions who have a, a fatalistic understanding of what karma means. 
but not everything that's arising is due to past causes. So I personally find it much easier not to worry about why they're arising and where they're coming from, but just to see how am I handling what's arising right now? Because I do know that my mind has an effect on what I experience and I can influence um, how much suffering or <laughs> unsatisfactoriness I'm going to experience um, now, de depending on how I relate to what's arising in my mind. You know, if I have a pain in the knee and I think, ah, this is terrible, I really don't want this, that pain just gets more and more solid. But if I say, oh, there's a pain in my knee, like, can I just, you know, either move it a little bit or just um, observe it with a lot of kindness as if I'm sort of shining some soothing balm on that knee, then you find that the sensations start to settle and start to get less. So I think it's much more important to pay attention to what we're doing now than to worry about what's happened in the past because we always have an opportunity to mold the mind and move it towards wholesome states. That's also a result of impermanence because nothing is fixed, everything's in a flow. Does that make sense? Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Jen Wilchanda. Um, yes. Uh, Jenny said you mentioned earlier about being in touch with the body and feelings to settle the mind before getting into the breath for meditation. Mm -hmm. I'd like a bit more clarification on that. Okay. Um, what I tend to do nowadays is um, I start my meditation by establishing the right motivation for the practice. So I'm practicing to free myself from suffering. I'm practicing out of kindness and compassion. And so I bring my awareness to the body to start to establish my awareness. Um, but I kind of infuse that awareness with a sense of friendship and warmth. So I'm not just looking at what's happening. I'm looking at it and also um, befriending it. Yeah. So, and then for me personally, I would scan through the body. So I'd either start at the feet or I'd start at the top of the head and I'd just spread that awareness through my body. So mentally, you know, with your inner eye, you're feeling different parts of your body, literally feeling them. So this is my forehead, this, this, this. You don't have to say the words, you just feel any sensation in those areas and you keep on spreading that awareness and keep on remembering to add the warmth, to add the kindness as though you're kind of looking at your inner world with kind eyes. And the more you stay with awareness on these different parts of the body, the more you start to notice happening there. At first you just think, oh, it's my arm, I can't really feel very much. But if your awareness stays there a bit longer, it's like, you know these lights you can get, which are saver lights, they come on and they're quite dim, but after a while you wait and they slowly start to brighten up. It's the same thing with our mind. We start to see, say, the arm and we feel like not very much. But if you just kind of listen, listen in, just, you know, be receptive to whatever's happening, not looking for anything special, you start to see lots of sensations in that area, maybe tingling, maybe warmth, maybe um, lightness or heaviness, maybe throbbing, especially in the knees or tension in the neck. And the more you stay there with mindfulness and kindness, the, the more the mind wakes up, yeah? So the mind starts becoming bright, it, becoming, it becomes present, and you're not so much dragged off into thoughts of the past or the future, you're more centered in the here and now. So you've established your mindfulness to a certain degree. And then generally speaking, if I feel my mindfulness is now strong enough, my mind's quite bright, I'll just ask my mind, do you want to see the breath? Like I actually ask it that, <laughs> do you want to see the breath? And then either the breath, you start to notice the breath or you don't and you just feel like staying with the body and both is completely fine. But if you do see the breath, you'll realize that your mind is already, um, your mindfulness is already strong enough to be able to stay with it a little bit because you've already established the mindfulness. Whereas if you sit down without going through your body first, Sometimes it's too restless to see such a subtle object as the breath and it requires a lot more effort and force. And if you make too much effort and force, you lose that kindness, you see, you lose the kindness. So it's nice to practice kind awareness on the body first. 
because the body is a bit of a coarser object. And then when you've established that, then you can invite in the breath. So that's what I meant. And I guess that's why Ajahn Brahm also says he spends quite a, a, a um, quite a long time, or well, not a long time, but many moments trying yeah. to make the body comfortable first before yes. he starts. Yeah, yeah, there's different reasons. I mean, I think in his case, it's a teaching method also, because most of the time he probably doesn't need to stay a lot with that. But sometimes he does just because it's a really beautiful way of caring for your body and making peace. And when the body's relaxed, it's able to sit for much longer, right? Because it feels settled. Yeah, it feels relaxed. And even it has many health benefits as well. So he'll start with that and he'll take his time. He's not in a rush at all, you know. Because I think what we need to learn generally with meditation is that it's such a different uh, path than anything we do in the outside world. So most of the time in the outside world, we think, oh, I need to do this, then this, then this, then this. And we think of things in a linear way. But with meditation, we're not trying to get on to the next thing and the next thing. We're just trying to go in. It's not going that way. It's not going this way. It's going this way. And we don't need to think, first I'll do this, then I'll do that. We just need to start right here and the most obvious place to start is with the body because we're embodied and then bit by bit you'll just go more and more deeply into the inner world and you'll see subtler and subtler things you know the body might get very light and it actually sort of fades into the background and then the breath comes in and then after a while the breath gets very light and then instead of that some sort of mental perception of the breath comes in like just some peace or some bliss comes in you know and things get increasingly subtle so but we have to start with where we are it's like he says i'm um, going in inside the present moment inside and going in and yeah. in and in exactly yeah there's another thing i really like that he says is um sometimes you think you're in the present moment you think you're with the breath right but then you realize that you're sort of with the breath, but you're with the idea of the breath. You're not kind of with this second of it. You're sort of seeing it as a breath and then you're seeing the next breath. You're sort of one step ahead. And he said at that time, it's like you have to um, zoom in like, um, like a camera, which is a little bit out of focus. Yeah, you're sort of in the present, but it's a bit smeared either side. And so you kind of shift the focus on your camera lens and just just a bit closer into the present so yeah you keep going in you keep going in but very gently not all at once very gently yep and sometimes it's um it's like um sometimes it's worse for me sometimes i can even see the craving like uh i'm expecting the next moment of breath and coming in and yes. out of that. so yes Yes, exactly that. Because you think you're with the breath, but you're sort of with it, but you're thinking of the next one. Yeah, yes, exactly that. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> it's gone into more of a concept that I'm breathing. And so you're sort of like second guessing it almost. Yes, yes. Yeah, I know that experience. And then it's like, oh, just this moment of this breath. And, and again, the mind becomes very gentle. You have to have a very gentle, soft mind to kind of come closer to the object yeah i i shall try that that is um mm. that still eludes me we will try that yeah yeah thank you venerable thank you so much You're um, very are, welcome. There, are there any other questions and you've also inspired me to do some meta meditation tonight <laughs> thank yes. you you know, that's my underlying motivation, really, <laughs> because I love meta meditation. And I think that's the one thing people don't do enough of and gives so much benefit. It's just incredible in terms of the benefit it gives, because not only is it a path into samadhi, it's also a very powerful way of overcoming any trace of ill will. Um, and it's also a very pleasant abiding. So for me, I often start with metta also before I go on to the breath. And then I already have a sense of PT coming up. I already have contentment and softness of the mind. So it's just a wonderful way to, you know, really, um, uh, what's the word, like um, removing, I suppose, the defilements as well. And it, it just feels good. And it translates into every area of life. 
you know you just become a much kinder person much more positive wow i shall make that my 2022 is it 2021 <laughs> resolution <laughs> yeah great <laughs> and just to follow on from that in case it helps is that um I mean, sometimes I do it as a whole practice in and of itself. Sometimes I do it before, you know, at the beginning of my meditation sitting. But also you can always find time to do it just before you sleep and as you wake up. And it's a really nice way of ending the day and going into a beautiful sleep with thoughts of loving kindness for the whole world. Or it might be just for yourself, you know, it depends. And then you wake up and again, establish your mind in loving kindness. And it kind of sets the intention for the whole day. And you'll notice that people you spread loving kindness to, when you meet them, you have a different feeling towards them. You feel much more friendly and because they've been in your mind, you know, it's like you've been rehearsing your relationship already. So when you meet them, they tend to, yeah, you tend to bring that loving kindness out in your body and speech, and they also pick up on it. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that sounds that sounds really beautiful. Thank you. It's really beautiful. Mm. Uh, uh, does anybody else have any uh, comments, questions? No, I think. Okay. Okay, um, shall we unmute ourselves and say three sadhus for this wonderful question and answer session? And the talk. <laughs> big sadhus. And the okay. talk, and the talk. Oh, very welcome. And please do very big sadhus. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Excellent. Venerable. And may we, may we invite you anytime to Singapore and the Buddhist Fellowship, anytime when the COVID pandemic is over, and may we wish everybody in Anukampa mm -hmm. um, all the best. May you all be safe and healthy and blissful and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> Remember the ha ha ha. Yes, the end of ho ho ho. <laughs> yes. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. I look Thank forward you. to that time. <laughs> ben Ro, can we uh, a request for a blessing for the? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll do my Burmese blessing. <clears throat> Sabe sata, sabe para, sabe buta, sabe pugala, sabe ata bawa pariapana. Saba itio Sabe povisa Sabe aria Sabe anaria Sabe dewa Sabe mendusa Sabe wini parika Awe la hon tu Abya paja hon tu Ani ga hon tu Sukiatanam pavihavan tu to come on jantu Yada lada sampatito Mawe get jantu Kamasaka Wow, 
Sadu, 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 sadu. <laughs> Thank you, Venerable. Thank you, Venerable. You're very welcome. <laughs>